Folks, thank you for tuning in to the Federalist Files. We're going to be going over Federalist number 71 today. Uh, it is titled The Duration and Office of the Executive, written by Alexander Hamilton, written on March 18th, 1788. Topics include defense of four-year term, providing stability, uh, which in essence gives the president a sense of duty. So this paper specifically is just about the four-year term and the reason for that four-year term, how it provides some sort of stability as well as accountability to the people themselves. Uh, this is the second one out of the four reasons of or, or the four components of energy for the president. We went over in the last one, uh, unity is in having it in the vesting the power of the executive in one person alone and not multiple. And this one specifically, it's going to be handling the uh, four-year term, the reason for that duration. So in this paper, Hamilton explains the duration of the office and defends the provision in the Constitution of the four-year term for the executive magistrate, also known as the president. He cites stability and firmness in the employment of executive powers as the impetus for the duration of the term. So Hamilton, he asserts, he starts off, and I quote, Duration in office has been mentioned as the second requisite to the energy of the executive authority. This has relation to two objects, to the personal firmness of of the executive magistrate in the employment of his constitutional powers and to the stability of the system of administration which may have been adopted under his auspices. So this is going to handle his firmness in his position, how confident he is in that position. If he were in a position where it was a shorter duration, if it's a longer duration, you're going to look at an expansion of power. They're going to feel more confident in expanding and, and oppressing people. And in the shorter term at the same time, they're actually going to feel the same way because they they have no skin in the game because they're saying, okay, well, it's almost like you have a lame duck-like situation. That's why I'm kind of, I don't really, I'm kind of iffy on the idea. If you're going to have a two-term limit in the presidency, then I think you should also as well have that in the legislative branch uh, because on that second term, now you are in a lame duck session. You're pretty much going to do whatever you can so your team wins. Uh but at the same time, I do understand that because then they can expand their power the more and more terms they get in. And as long as, you know, the, the media class as well as the, um, the government itself continue to kind of coordinate with each other, then you're better off having these, these terms, uh, these term limits. So I'm kind of, I don't, I don't really know exactly what I think. I'm kind of, the jury's still out for me on that one specifically because I understand Term limits would be a good thing if you have an oppressive regime, but at the same time, then you give yourself a lame duck presidency at the very end of your presidency, you try to get a lot of things done, you try to squeeze in a lot of oppressive measures and means just to score your party political points. So it is kind of weird for me. And he said, I think the second, the second one, he said, the stability of the system of administration, which may have been adopted under his auspices, which is pretty much the same thing. It's just the stability being able to uh, run the system, no, not be overbearing and usurp your power. So, he goes on, he states, and I quote, With regard to the first, it must be evident that the longer the duration in office, the greater will be the probability of obtaining so important an advantage. It is a general principle of human nature that a man will be interested in whatever he possesses in proportion to the firmness and precariousness of the tenure by which he holds it will be less attached to what he holds by a momentary or uncertain title than to what he enjoys by a durable or certain title, and of course will be willing to risk more for the sake of the one than for the sake of the other, end quote. So, very interesting what he says is, if you give them a shorter term, if you don't give them a legitimate presidency, a legitimate title, they're going to take it less seriously and they're kind of going to do whatever they want because they don't take the position of the presidency seriously if they're going to have a one-year term or a two-year term rather than a four-year term. It's kind of similar if you think about the way that people view marriage in a way. You say when you're in a relationship, it's not really as serious, but then when you realize, oh, we're engaged, that's that's an extra step, that's a big deal, and then you get to, you know, we're married, this this now has much more firmness, uh, precariousness, and you should be more interested in this new title that you have. You should take it much more seriously. That's the way I, I like to kind of look at it. So he continues next, he states, and I quote, The inference from it is that a man acting in the capacity of chief magistrate under a consciousness that in a very short time he must lay down his office will be apt to feel himself too little interest interested in it to hazard any material censure or perplexity. 
from the independent exertions of his power, or from encountering the ill humors, however transient, which may happen to prevail either in a considerable part of the society itself or even in a predominant faction in the legislative body, end quote. It's very interesting. So he says, somebody that doesn't really take it that seriously, they're going to be very little interested in doing their job, following through, and they're going to have their own independent exertion of power because they don't really care about losing their position because, in their opinion, it's almost like a lame duck type scenario, and that's why I say I'm, I'm kind of iffy on that, that term limit from the presidency uh, without having those same term limits on the legislative branch as well. Uh, and so, so then Hamilton feared that a short-term duration would jeopardize the integrity and the fortitude of the executive magistrate, also known as the president, because he wouldn't think of the endorsement of the people in his actions for a continuance of, all, continuance of office because it's such a short term. Uh, Hamilton defines, and, and as well as if you had a longer term, then you're really not going to, if you're running in, if you have an eight-year term, for example, and you're in your second year of the eight-year term, you're really not going to care about anything that you do at this exact moment because you're running for re-election in like six years. So who cares? Uh, you notice, especially in this state, for example, this is going to be the first year that we're not going to have a raise of the taxes, a raise in property taxes as well. Uh, state income tax is not going to raise. State sales tax also isn't going to raise in this state. And it's the first time in a very long time that we've had this. And the reason for that is because we have our governor now running as well as there was some COVID relief, but the governor doesn't want to raise taxes the year before his election because then he knows people aren't going to elect him. Uh, whereas in this state of New Jersey, everybody here's mind, they're totally brainwashed, he'll get voted back in. No matter how badly he does, he has the most extensive powers amongst all the governors in the entire country. He has the most oppressive powers. He just actually tried to recently, they tried to pass in this quick bill without any recognition, very last second, got some media coverage. He tried to pass a bill to extend his powers permanently, his executive order powers that he had during COVID, to, to permanently extend those emergency powers that he had. Uh, they tried to pass that through, and I don't really know what ended up happening. I know people were uh, they were protesting outside of the state courthouse, I believe. So, uh, Hamilton defines the concepts of Republican government in the next section of this paper. People, in general, intend the public good. In turn, this applies to their er very errors. They should despise that they are always right about the means of promoting the public good. So, here he kind of explains how there's going to be some party animus, there's also going to be some bad actors that attempt to trick the people into giving their rights away for the quote-unquote promoting the public good, which is very similar to what has just transpired this last year and a half. So this is what he states, and I quote, The Republican principle demands that the deliberate sense of the community should govern the conduct of those to whom they entrust in the management of their affairs. But it does not require an unqualified complacence to every sudden breeze of passion or to every transient impulse which the people may receive from the arts of men who flatter their prejudices to betray their interests. It is a just observation that the people commonly intend the public good. This often applies to their very errors, but their good sense would despise the adulator who should pretend that they are they always reason right about the means of promoting it. They know from experience that they sometimes err, and the wonder is that they do seldom err as they do, beset as they continually are by the wiles of parasites and sycophants, by the snares of the ambitious, the avaricious, and the desperate, by the artifices of men who possess their confidence more than they deserve it, and of those who seek to possess rather than to deserve it, end quote. Very interesting. He goes into this whole word soup. When he says er, it means kind of erroneous. You make errors. It's just an old-timey word that they used to use. Uh, he's pretty much saying you're going to have people that you entrust in the, that work in the government. Uh, they're, they're going to kind of play to your reactions. They're going to play to your emotions. And they're going to go ahead and they're going to try to propose some sort of legislation to really betray your interests for the intention of the common good and this is this is the whole the vision of the anointed uh, this is how communists usually implement their communist regime it's always for the greater good of society we're going to give everybody free health care we're going to give everybody free education systems um we're going to be the most literate class a literate country in the entire world like cuba tried to do and that's just another way to implement it. it's another trojan horse to take more rights away from you this is something that we've seen throughout the last year and a half so it's a very good example we have 
uh, actually still currently going on right now. So what I think is interesting when he says this, and this is a legit, this is the communist manifesto playbook when he says but their good sense would despise the adulator who should pretend that they always reason right about the means of promoting it so at the end the end to them to the socialists is that that end is so justified that the means don't matter by how you attain that end it is also known as the end justifies the means and that's exactly what he says here and this is in 17 uh what 77 or 78 or I'm sorry, 1788. And he's saying this, you know, two, almost 250 years ago, and it still rightly applies today. So Hamilton feared that a short-term duration would jeopardize the integrity and the fortitude. Oh, no, I already mentioned that. So Hamilton claims that sometimes they're influenced by the artifices of men who possess their confidence more than they deserve it, and of those who seek to possess rather than to deserve it. That's another thing. All they care about is holding this power. They care about possessing the power over the people. And we put their confidence in them thinking that they they deserve it. And they really don't at the end of the day. They just want to possess your power. Uh, At the end of the day, you know, the power is always in the hands or should be in the hands of the people. So these men take advantage of the people's desires to promote the public good, to promote their own personal agenda. Hamilton next, he asserts, and I quote, When occasions present themselves in which the interests of the people are at variance with their inclinations, it is the duty of the persons whom they have appointed to be the guardians of those interests, to withstand the temporary delusion in order to give them time and opportunity for more cool and sedate reflection, end quote. So really it's the power of, in the case, for example, I can, I can best illustrate this an example from any, any shooting, any mass shooting. Uh, you have the Democratic legislators coming out and they say, we need gun control, we need gun control. Uh, people will say, oh, you know, that sounds like a good idea because what they do is they pull at your heartstrings. They say, oh, well, you know, these people are dying, there are innocent people that pass away, whatever, what have you. And then the answer to them is, oh, well, we want more gun control. We're going to take the guns out of... So so one person does a bad thing, an illegal thing, a, a criminal does something illegal. So what we're going to do, in essence, in turn, to resolve that is a criminal does something wrong. So we're going to now punish all the law-abiding citizens and take their guns away from them. That's their answer in the Democrat Party. Um, Republican Party, they're much more Second Amendment uh, protectors... But they don't, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Just like the Democrat Party, but, you know, they're, Republicans are really just kind of wish-washy. They're good losers. They lose with dignity. You know, that's that's what the Democrats like to see in a Republican. That's why they like Mitt Romney so much. So at the end of the day, uh, what you're supposed to do in that position of power is you're supposed to kind of cool off, wait it out, see what happens from the people. But at the end of the day, you should never, you you take an oath on the con- to the country and to the Constitution And you should never attempt to upend that constitution because then you're just not the person that should be doing that job. Uh, Now, this is the position of the representatives elected by the people to not act in favor of their constituents at their own defense. Uh, At the end of the day, the best answer, really, to interpret this would be to just follow the constitution. You're supposed to follow your constituents, but this is, once again, this is a constitutional a rep- uh, constitutional republic. This is not a democracy. There's no rob- mob rule here, even though the Democrats love to espouse that it's a democracy all the time. It's not a democracy. It's a constitutional republic. Therefore, the people, the Constitution is the thing that protects the people. If you want to make any amendment to the Constitution, you can do it, but you have to go through the state legislature too as well. And we commonly see now is what they try to do is they try to pass law, codify law that is directly against the Constitution and somehow it's not requiring a constitutional amendment, which it should. And that really, essentially, that's the biggest safeguard that you can find on, uh, you know, individual rights and freedoms. Hamilton next he explains from the perspective of the legislature that the executive should be in a situation to dare to act uh, his own opinion with vigor and decision. So next he states, and I quote, But however inclined we might be to insist upon an unbounded complacence in the executive to the inclinations of the people, we can with no propriety contend for a like complacence to the humors of the legislature. The latter may sometimes stand in opposition to the former, and at other times the people may be entirely neutral. In either supposition, it is certainly desirable that the executive should be in a situation to dare to act his own opinion with vigor and decision. So they're saying the executive should always be held to a standard 
whether it's the people themselves that hold them to the standard or it's the legislature, the federal legislature, or even the state legislatures themselves uh, that should, should hold him to a standard so he doesn't feel like he can go and act on his own opinion or, or vigor in his decision. At the end of the day, it should be the people themselves that determine decisions by the government. That's the whole reason why it's called self-government and not self-government in the way when Joe Biden says, well, we're, I represent, I am you, you know, when the... <laughs> <laughs> when the politicians go up there and they say, I am you, this is self-government. No, this, you are not us. We, we determine who you are, but you are not us, dude. You, you are a multimillionaire. You took money from communist China. Uh, your son took money from communist China as well. And some Russian situations too, with Burisma energy company with no experience. Your son got on their board making $80,000 a month. You are not us because I don't, I don't get those kind of deal. I wish, I wish I can get that kind of deal. Uh, so Hamilton claims that the legislature and governments purely Republican have a propensity to absorb other branches of government, and these examples have been illustrated in preceding papers. This is this is a kind of interesting part, point that he makes here, uh, this assertion, and it is true historically. So he states, and I quote, the same rule, the same rule which teaches the propriety of a partition between the various branches of power teaches us likewise that the partition ought to be so contrived as to render the one independent of the other. To what purpose separate the executive or the judiciary from the legislative if both the executive and the judiciary are so constituted as to be at the absolute devotion of the legislative? Such a separation must be merely nominal and incapable of producing the ends of which it was established. It is one to be subordinate to the laws and another to be dependent on the legislative body." End quote. So more importantly, he says, you shouldn't have the other two branches ever depend on the legislative body. You should be subordinate to the laws as in you should be subordinate to the Constitution. Your position is no better than the Constitution. That's the way that every single uh, public official, whether you're a senator, House of Rep, whether you're a Supreme Court justice, whether you are the president of the United States, you at the end of the day, you are always subordinate to the Constitution, to the people themselves. Is what he's saying here, and no one should be subordinate to the legislative body. That's not the way that you shouldn't feel that we should not have a government that's set up, and this is the way it used to be in old republics, where you are dependent on the legislative body more than you are the people or the constitutional or the governing document. So, the representatives of the people tend to argue that they are the people themselves and use this leverage in order to create impatience and disgust amongst the people against other branches of government, Hamilton notes. And this is where he kind of mentions the legislative authority absorbing all the other branches, and they do it at the behest of of selling themselves as, well, we're representatives of the people. We are what the people vote for. This is what they want. So we're, we are above, and the Constitution should defer to us, where realistically it is polar opposite, where the Constitution has the power of the legislative branch. And I just think... I just mentioned this exact example before, and this is what the government does is they say, oh, we're representative of the people, so you guys have to pass what we say. So next he goes on. He states, and I quote, the tendency of the legislative authority to absorb every other has been fully displayed and illustrated by examples in some preceding papers. In governments purely Republican, this tendency is almost irresistible. The representatives of the people in a popular assembly seem sometimes to fancy that they are the people themselves and betray strong symptoms of impatience and disgust at the least sign of, of opposition from any other quarter, as if the exercise of its rights by either the executive or judiciary were a breach of their privilege and an outrage to their dignity. End quote. Yeah, so they just... This is a common theme from republics historically, is you have the, the legislative authority always absorbing everything else because they themselves think that they are superior to the other branches of government and they claim that because they represent the people that are somehow uh, you know, above and superior to the other branches. So Hamilton, he continues, he states, and I quote, And as they commonly have the people on their side, they always act with such momentum as to make it very difficult for the other members of the government to maintain the balance of the Constitution, end quote. So this is where he they they invoke the people being on their side to pass legislation. You see this with with gun control. Like, oh, well, people are dying. People support this. This poll means this, and this means that. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. No, none of that matters because the because the document, the constitutional document. If you guys want to get that done, you guys got to get seventy five percent of the states. At the that's what you guys have to do. 
to get that done. If you want to resolve what you think is such a problem, you think uh, gun violence is an epidemic in the country, then that's what you guys have to do. Really, they'll they could never be able to do that through the state. If they if they're able to do that through the state constitution or through the states themselves, get seventy five percent of them to agree with a confiscation of firearms, then by that time we're already done as a country at that point. So Hamilton uh, he concludes. And I quote, it cannot be affirmed that a duration of four years or any other limited duration would completely answer the end proposed, but it would contribute towards it in a degree which would have material influence upon the spirit and the character of the government. End quote. So he says, you know, this isn't a completely perfect provision, but he definitely can affirm that the four year duration is, is not going to be too short. And it's also not going to be too long, and it'll contribute to that degree of, of spirit and character that you're looking, that energy that you're looking at of the executive branch. Hamilton feared that the executive can, uh, that the executive ran the risk of eradication after every termination of term, but the best guarantee to firmness and confidence is derived from where the executive gained their power in the first place, the esteem and the goodwill will of the people. So he goes on next, he states, and I quote, Let's see if he, I think I already said that one. He states next, and I quote, Between the commencement and termination of such a period, there would always be a considerable interval in which the prospect of annihilation would be sufficiently remote not to have an improper effect upon the conduct of a man endued with a tolerable portion of fortitude and in which he might reasonably promise himself that there would be time enough before it arrived to make the community sensible to the propriety of the measures he might incline to pursue. Uh, so, so this is him talking about the president in particular, that there's a good enough interval in the amount of time that if he's going to pursue this, that he has the proper fortitude to do so and he can't get overpowered by the legislative authority. Uh, there's much more to be feared from, and I mentioned this last episode there's much more to be feared from the legislative authority than there is from the executive branch but once again they it always comes back to the executive because they're kind of the leader head of the nation as the uh as the commander-in-chief so next he goes on he states and i quote though it be probable that as he approached the moment when the public were by a new election to signify their sense of his conduct his confidence and with it his firmness would decline Yet both the one and the other would derive support from the opportunities which his previous continuance in the station had afforded him. Of establishing himself in the esteem and goodwill of his constituents, he might then hazard with safety in proportion to the proofs he had given of his wisdom and integrity, and to the title he had acquired to the respect and attachment of his fellow citizens. End quote. So, the president firmly runs on the people. On on the the his con based off his conduct, what the people vote on, it is their confidence in him, and that gives him a sense of esteem if he's doing a good job. If not, you know, because because his power is derived from the support of the people, so he'll know when an election's coming up that it will signify how much they actually like this like this president, uh, whether or not they want him in for another term, and based off of that he will kind of tiptoe around or he'll he'll act in goodwill towards what the people want. The people hold him accountable. I don't think our problem really is actually the president in a lot of regards ever. I think it's the legislative branch. Once again, the most powerful ones, they're the ones that decide to pass the power on to the executive a lot of the time. And then you have a lot of really bad actors that work in the uh, legislative branch as well. Just the Democrat Party in general just have such terrible actors. In the government in a general sense, you have some bad actors. But in the Democrat Party, you truly do. You have some like communist actors working out of the Democrat Party. So Hamilton next, he states, and I quote, As on the one hand, a duration of four years will contribute to the firmness of the executive in a sufficient degree to render it a very valuable ingredient in the com composition so, on the other, it is not enough to justify any alarm for the public liberty. End quote. So, yeah, having that four-year duration, that four-year term, very valuable in the composition to have an energetic executive, a firm executive, but it's not too long to justify any alarm to the public liberty because, once again, the longer your term, the more lame duck-like presidency you have, 
when the president will just, just do whatever they want because they're not really worried about getting voted out of office. So Hamilton uses the British House of Commons as an example. They have, to a, they have, to a certain degree, the ability to overturn the power of the monarch. If that can be done to an executive with such an abundance of power, there's nothing to be feared from a four-year term of pre presidential encroachments. And this is a long paragraph, but it's well worth your time. He's going to talk a, bit, a little bit about how the British House of Commons is in their parliamentary system has found a way to actually mitigate some of the powers of the monarch over in Britain. If a, uh, he states, and I quote, If a British House of Commons, from the most feeble beginnings, from the mere power of assenting or disagreeing to the imposition of a new tax, have by ra rapid strides reduced the prerogatives of the crown and the privileges of the nobility within the limits they conceived to be compatible with the principles of a free government, while they raise themselves to the rank and consequence of a co-equal branch of the legislature, if they have been able to, in one instance to abolish both the royalty and the aristocracy, and to overturn all the ancient establishments as well in the church as state, if they have been able on a recent occasion to make the monarch tremble at the prospect of an innovation attempted by them, what would be to be feared from an elective magistrate of four years' duration with the confined authorities of a president of the United States? End quote. What he's saying what he's alluding to is Great Britain, you have a monarch, super powerful, way more powers than the president had at this time. The parliament was actually able to keep that person in check and take a little bit of the powers away from that president and bring it back to the people and to the legislative branch as well. So there's nothing to be feared from. And, and you're talking about a monarch that's a hereditary a hereditary uh, king that, that runs a life term. If, if they're able to hold that guy under wraps then we shouldn't have any problems with somebody that's running a four-year term with less power and more power in the legislative branch and in the hands of the people. It's really, that's that's his uh, argument. So Hamilton, he ends this, this paper. He states, and I quote, I shall only add that if his duration be such as to leave a doubt of his firmness, that doubt is inconsistent with a jealousy of his encroachments, end quote. So in other words, what he's saying is the objection to the duration of the term is far surpassed by the jealousy of the power of the president. That is really the uh, true driving force, the impetus behind this dissatisfaction from the dissenters is, is what he's saying. People really, the firmness, if there was a duration, he, I doubt that uh, it is inconsistent with the jealousy of his encroachment. So they're just really jealous of the, pre the, president's, the presidential power. And another important point that he made before that in the quote is that they were able in the parliament to separate church and state because at that time in England and in a lot of the uh, the European countries, the church was running the country. It was a theocracy where, you know, everybody knows that transfer of power over in France where it was a Protestant and it was a Catholic, Protestant, Catholic part. You know, people were just getting killed. They were getting the guillotine over and over again, depending which religion which sect i guess of christianity was in power at that time so that will conclude this one i greatly appreciate him for tuning in these have kind of been longer they've been longer in writing so i try to kind of run through it as quickly as i can i don't want to keep it you know much more than 30 minutes give or take so i try to keep it short and concise for everybody because no one wants to hear me ramble on about you know a couple pages worth of writing so i greatly appreciate everybody tuning in as always uh, please check out the weekend special, current event episodes. Those hit pretty big. People enjoy those. So, uh, yeah, show your friends. Let everybody know about po podcasts. Let everybody know about, you know, you got a conservative guy here giving you a conservative point of view, perspective. That is a little different than the mainstream. You're not going to really get this at Fox News. Maybe and you're really not going to get this at Newsmax either because Newsmax kind of, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of them either. Maybe One America News. I don't really listen to them as much. As well, but I'm really I, I'm completely independent. I don't I'm not funded by anybody, and I don't come out here with perspectives to push anybody into a further direction. I'm not aligned with any real party. I mean, I vote Republican, but I'm not really aligned with the Republican Party. I'm not also I'm nowhere near the Democrat Party. So you're just listening to a dude with conservative values, conservative principles, working class, just like the rest of you at home. So. I can relate much more to you, the listeners, than I than I do to uh, you know these big wigs, these guys like no 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 offense to Sean Hannity, but a guy like Sean Hannity that's making millions of dollars, he's been doing it for years, making a lot of money. I'm just like you guys, I'm just like everybody else that's listening. So uh, I greatly appreciate everybody tuning in. 
as always, you know, ch check out some of these current event episodes I have. Greatly appreciate it, and uh, take care. I will see you all next time. Hey.